Um, well, good morning, everyone. I'm so delighted to see everyone. Thank you so much for coming and joining us on this Friday morning. Um, I'm Al Mathers. I'm Director of Research and Learning at the RSA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this special event marking the launch of a new RSA report on the well-being impacts of a universal basic income. As part of an academic partnership funded by Wellcome, the RSA is exploring the potential for a UBI, how it could work in practice, and what its impacts might be. With the current cost of living crisis front and centre for us all, this research has never been more timely in providing a robust picture of the economic and social pressures that are having a detrimental effect on mental health. In particular, this is showing up amongst our young people. The research brings together new analysis which shows that even a fiscally neutral UBI could have a significant effect in reducing poverty and insecurity and bringing health benefits to those participating in the scheme. The report Challenging the Mental Health Crisis is produced in partnership with a consortium led by Northumbria University and funded by the Wellcome Trust. And I'd like to offer a huge thank you to the many partners and collaborators on this work. These include our academic colleagues from across Oxford, Northumbria, Bristol, Liverpool, UCL, Newcastle and, U and York universities, and particular mention goes to the early career researchers, Aswa Villardson, Fiorella Para, Muhaka, and Elliot Johnson. We'd also like to um, note Howard Reed's contribution from Landman Economics and our own research and wider team at the RSA. It's been a true pleasure to be part of such an inspiring and cross-disciplinary team. This work has real strategic relevance for the RSA. After having launched our new Design for Life mission earlier in May, at a time where we're all experiencing the first-hand impact of a world increasingly out of balance and the fragility of our current economic, social and environmental systems, Design for Life lays out a commitment from the RSA to rebalance these relationships. That means that we need to grow social opportunity and innovation through the development of agency, capabilities, ideas and connections for all people that will help us transition towards a truly regenerative future. That's a great vision. However, for this to be realised, we need to head on address the current social inequalities and barriers that we experience day by day. Resetting and redesigning our economic and social systems is therefore critical. If we are to unlock wider social potential and critically to support the flourishing and resilience of all people across their life course, and that's for the benefit of our communities and our planet. Today, I'm delighted that we're joined by a fantastic panel of speakers here in the room, as well as others joining online. I'm really delighted to welcome Matthew Johnson and Hannah Webster here with me on stage, and we'll hear from each of them shortly regarding the critical findings and analysis from the report. Matthew Johnson is Professor of Politics at Northumbria University and Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. His work is centrally concerned with addressing issues of inequality, social justice and exclusion, both in his native northeast and beyond. Hannah Webster is the RSA's Head of Research with expertise and focus in the areas of economic security, well-being, housing and young people's advocacy. I will then invite responses from our distinguished guest speakers, Professor Guy Standing and Ruth Lister, and I'll introduce them more fully then. We'll be using our time to have a conversation around the key themes arising and to answer some of your questions. So please prepare your thoughts, because we would like to hear from you directly. For those watching online, 
Do drop your questions and comments into the YouTube chat or on Twitter using the hashtag RSAUBI. We'll try to get through as many of these as possible before we wrap up at 10.45 a.m. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Matthew. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Al. So this is a, a real pleasure in lots of different respects, um, not least because the kind of work that the RSA has done over the course of centuries is integrally tied to dealing with core critical socioeconomic challenges. And the sorts of work that we've done over the past couple of years with the RSA has been innovative in a number of different respects, not least insofar as it's committed to genuine interdisciplinary collaboration and collaboration with partners. And the report that we launched today gives an evidence base for a policy that, that really is, see, that really is quite sensible. And one of the recurring themes that, that comes up in conversations with policymakers is, oh, this sounds like a really good idea in the abstract, but nobody would ever vote for it. And we've tested that idea to destruction. And the findings that we present here really do suggest that this is not just a good policy. It's a policy that people recognise as being good and recognise as being integral to dealing with the sorts of challenges that Al quite rightly highlighted. So why don't we have a UBI? But it just makes sense. It satisfies our needs. We can't feed ourselves, we can't house ourselves without cash. Um, so we should just get cash. Um, it secures us. It ensures that we don't face the risk of destitution, of being made homeless, of being cast out into the streets if we can't afford rent or mortgage payments. It lets us do the things we need to do. And for somebody from the northeast of England who grew up in a, a household that was workless, um, it is incredibly important to recognise the financial basis of any economic and educational activity. If you haven't got a cash base to do the kind of entrepreneurial activities that we need to engage in, the kind of educational activities that we need to engage in to deal with our regional inequalities and the inequalities within our regions, we're just not able to, to develop fully. So we need cash. It helps us individually and as a nation. And at a time in which Britain is fractured and broken up and almost in a process of atrophying, we need this sort of transformative policy to enable us all to get on and work collectively to face our challenges. And the most damning element of this is that rich people already have it. It's incredible. We have to emphasise the extent to which rich people have basic income simply by virtue of the fortune of having parents who were already rich. And uh, somebody went to an open day at Newcastle when I was 18 to, to be surrounded by people who'd just come off winter holidays and to be dumbfounded by the possibility that people could afford winter holidays, this, this really strikes true. The amount of talent that is lost in this country by virtue of the absence of economic su support is disgraceful. And we have to deal with this. We have to level up society as a whole. So I, I find these dismantled idea, um, nice idea, but nobody would vote for it. And they do that through, the, the report does that through a number of different mechanisms. Perhaps most importantly, it focuses on the health case. UBI affects health by reducing poverty. Quite obviously, if you reduce poverty, people are better able to feed themselves, better able to afford to heat their houses, to reduce a whole manner of poverty-related conditions. It mitigates inequality. Some of the most harmful effects that we have in the world of work and our personal relationships are those which are attendant to stress. If we're abused, exploited, dominated, whether in work or in home, um, we cannot do well. This gives us a get out. And um, for all of us who are faced daily with stress, this is, this is really important. And it promotes long-term thinking. A lot of the behavioural um, processes that lead to uh, yeah, short-term ill health and long-term ill health stem from people presuming that their lives are not going to be long. Smokers, for example, um, when you confront smokers with the thought that smoking is going to kill them, there's a possibility, actually, that it's going to increase smoking because people go, oh, well, you know, I haven't got long to live, so I might as well really enjoy it. Puff away as much as I possibly can. Yeah. Um, in effect, UBI is the per perfect multi-purpose policy for our times. It deals with a whole range of different challenges, not just health, economics, um, crime, a whole range of different things. And we've got this 
ridiculously con convoluted model of impact for health there. Now, you're not going to be able to read it, but let me assure you that it's got an evidence base behind it, and it, it's transformative in the way in it, which it sets out potential savings to the country to the tune of several hundred billion pounds a year. Mental health costs this country 118 billion quid a year. Um, this is a policy that can address that and claw back all of that lost resource. So the question then is, well, you know, people get, people develop mental health conditions from nowhere. It's just a disease of the brain. And there is this genuine debate within the literature about the extent to which inequality and poverty causes uh, mental ill health. Um, so we've looked at this and we're developing an evidence base that suggests that, come on, there you go, um, that actually it's not... That, that income or financial insecurity in particular is a, is a core driver of anxiety and depression. So you can see there's, you've got a health gradient there that relates to people's quintile of income. So the richer you are, the, more, um, the less likely you are to develop anxiety and depression. And if you look at the four graphs, um, if that top, the graph on the top right-hand corner, which is satisfaction with income, were um, inverted to dissatisfaction with income, you'd have four identical, almost identical graphs, which all suggest that if you get people to a minimum income standard, which at the time was about 10 grand, but it's probably going to be 13 grand now because of the cost of living crisis, people's satisfaction with their income increases, um, anxiety and depression fall off a cliff edge, and people do much better. People need money, and ultimately, this is a good way of providing them with the money, the quantity and quality that they need. And it's affordable. So Howard Reed's Glanman economics modelling of these schemes suggests that these are fiscally neutral if you, uh, for starter schemes, but can be funded, the more expensive schemes that get you directly to minimum income standard level can be funded through wealth and land taxes, which bring in uh, potentially hundreds of billions of pounds. The eradication of morally outrageous tax reliefs and subsidies that contribute daily to um, the climate crisis and to the exacerbation of inequality. And um, perhaps most importantly in this context, savings in efficiency and health. Ill health, poverty, inequality cost this country a fortune. And we, need to, we, can't, we can't afford to continue to, um, to fail in this regard. So look, UBI offers clear pathways to outcomes than the alternatives. So I, I think Hannah's gonna talk through the qualitative research that we did with young people but it was quite clear from the, the citizen engagement work and the engagement work that we do with young people in, in general that young people realise that the system doesn't work for them. Um, they want to achieve financial well-being. They understand the financial basis of all of the things they want to achieve. Um, but they face a trade-off between work that doesn't pay enough, study that may not lead to secure outcomes, and leisure that's increasingly unaffordable. Education, the supposed pathway to, to success, is being undermined by financial insecurity. It's very difficult to perform well if you are at desperate risk of destitution and if your mental well-being is being undermined. So as a consequence, young, young people intuitively support UBI. And it was quite consistent to see that you, young people really see this as a means of dealing with the challenges of their times. So what's the impact on public health? Well, we tried to model the prospective impact of uh, introducing three UBI schemes on anxiety and depression. And um, that was possible until the, ex the cost of living crisis and the mini budget, which skewed the Gini coefficient, the amount of inequality, prospective inequality in the country, the amount of poverty, <coughs> so much that it, the, the, fate, the data that we've got available could no longer accommodate it. So if Things were as they were in 2019. You could see hundreds of thousands of cases of anxiety and depression uh, just within the 14 to 24-year-old cohort, uh, prevented or delayed over a period of time um, through introduction of UBI schemes. The figures that are presented here are likely massive underestimates. Um, the sorts of policy developments that we've seen in the last couple of months and the sorts of crises that we face mean that the levels of anxiety and depression are likely to be underestimates, and the number of cases that could be prevented and delayed are likely to be underestimates. So that, that suggests that the savings that the introduction of a UBI scheme could make are much greater than the savings that we've suggested here. 
So then, right, so it makes sense of public, public health terms. Is it popular? Well, we tested this to destruction. We worked with constituencies in the Red Wall that were regarded as being inimical, in, in, yeah, as being fundamentally opposed to progressive policy. Um, and what we found was consistent high levels of support for UBI. It's counterintuitive. It's supposed to be regressive um, fiscal conservatives in the Red Wall. But actually what we found was consistently, as in the rest of the country, you get 70 to 80% approval ratings for UBI when it's pre presented effectively. You get 10% of the population consistently expressing objection to UBI, and there's strong, strong opposition. But what we did was to work with those opponents to develop narratives to persuade people like them that this is a good policy. And the narratives that they developed, which focused on security and, and health impact, massively increased the level of support among people who hate the policy. So that minority, that 10%, when presented with narratives developed by people like them, um, that opposition just fades away. So you get 50% approval ratings. So what we have to understand is that there's no reason why politicians can't get people to vote in their own interest. And what's happened over the last few decades is that politicians, progressive politicians in particular, have said people just vote against their interests and there's no means of getting them to, to vote rationally. And we find no evidence of that. We find evidence that as soon as you persuade people with good narratives, strong narratives about the material impact on their lives, they support this policy. And that's critically important given the crises that we're facing at the minute and critically important in terms of developing electoral strategies for the forthcoming election. So this is transformative, this, this report, and I encourage, encourage you to read it and to um, see the, the evidence that's been presented because I, I think it is um, significant. It, it's a significant development of the debate. And I'm really grateful to the RSA for, for hosting this and to work, for working so collaboratively on it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew, for yeah, bringing such a kind of comprehensive picture of the compelling case that's made through the different evidence in this report. I'd like to now, if it's okay, we'll take questions kind of after we've heard also from Hannah, um, who's going to kind of talk us through the deeper work that we did with young people that's informed this work too. Great, thanks so much. Um, and thanks, Matthew, partly for taking the harder bit of this presentation <laughs> and doing the data while I just offer some musings, uh, but also for stewarding this work over the last year. So at the RSA, we have um, a long history of working around uh, a universal basic income, mm. but we really came to this piece of work with an understanding that we live in an age of economic insecurity. And rather than it being an experience at the margins, this is something that's widespread, and I'd go as far as to say built into our systems. And we see this show up in a range of ways. I mean, this week alone, I could probably list about 10, uh, but also through our housing, things like a concentration of uh, uh, on growth over distribution, profits over wages, and so on. And there are really fundamental factors which are at play here. I think we could all agree no single intervention will overcome that, but there are big levers that we can pull, pull to improve it. Uh, and a critical one, of course, is our approach to social security. Uh, and that's the idea that societally we should have mechanisms in place to provide financial security, as Matthew outlines, uh, in a really compelling way to anyone who needs it. Uh, and again, I think it would be an understatement to say that ethos has been eroded in recent years. Uh, think about the conversations in recent months about conditionality, work requirements, uprating benefits, frozen housing payments. There's a whole range of ways to set up something that really feels more akin to a social insecurity. And for the youngest generations, those going through transitions to adulthood now and in the coming years, we wanted to understand what a more ambitious underpinning of that welfare state might look like. So our role, the RSA's role in this partnership, was to hold conversations with 14 to 24 year olds. Uh, they were all living in Bradford. We spent four hours with them, um, which they were great at <laughs> staying focused for, uh, over a couple of evenings in small groups to understand what their lives were like now, what they see in their future, and then what a universal basic income might mean to them. And as we spoke to them about their lives today, it was clear they were living with fragility. Uh, we spoke to young people who had a range of income sources coming to them, uh, but from different backgrounds, they all reflected on similar tensions. Uh, those in education were often also in work to make ends meet. Those on benefits echoed wider RSA research, which had found four in five young people on universal credit lived precariously. 
Uh, and those who received parental support also reported feelings of guilt and stress, knowing they were reliant on money that might be needed elsewhere or that their friends couldn't access in the same way. And we heard directly uh, about the drivers of anxiety and stress around money, from a lack of enough money to get by through to the balance of work and studies they were having to take on and their ability to plan for the future. And for every young person, these challenges were different and they were complex. Uh, one young person, I thought, summed it up. Uh, I was going to say quite nicely, but <laughs> I'm not sure that's quite the right phrase. Uh, they said that they wanted to be able to get a nice job in the future and have enough money to have a happy, healthy life, but they just didn't know how they were going to do that, and they were nervous for their own future. And that young person wasn't even 16 yet, but spoke to a sentiment that spread across our groups. Very few thought the benefit system was for them, almost unanimously. They thought that, and this is regardless of any design of the system, the delivery was unfair, stigmatising, and left people uh, at the margins of support when really it should be more expansive. And so what we got from these conversations, and ours in some of them as well, was that this isn't a generation that are supported to reach their potential. It's one being quickly thrust into realities of individualism for a little support underneath it. We then moved the conversation on. Uh, they're at about hour two or three by now. Uh, and we explored uh, what a universal basic income might mean, navigating in turn the pros and the cons uh, of, of an intervention like it. Uh, and together, young people led with their ideas about what a universal basic income would mean to them, sharing positives like increased security, a better balance between work and well-being, Increasing their, improving their relationships by taking money out of the equation and offering the opportunity to engage with better work or learning opportunities. A lot of young people talked about their personal circumstances first, like cutting down their hours to benefit their grades, but some also considered the wider societal impacts it might have. Uh, one young person said that if they had more money, that would have a knock-on effect on their health and the NHS wouldn't be as strained as it is. They said they felt there'd be a lot of ripple effects that would happen. And I thought it was quite powerful that that young person made that uh, reference before much of the work that Matthew talked about had happened. They were identifying the knock-ons that we've been able to evidence through this research. Uh, and I think that's incredibly powerful, what we found. Over half a million avoided post or postponed cases of anxiety and depression amongst that age group over a decade with a universal basic income at a minimum income stand standard. It's such an astounding figure that I think we all have to sit up and listen to it. Uh, particularly for a policy which has long been discussed solely in its economic terms. So after a balanced conversation with young people, they unanimously supported a UBI in principle, and this was before they had that data on the health analysis. It can be easy to dismiss the idea purely in terms of an immediate expense, but the lasting impact of a more expansive, generous and wellbeing-centred approach to policy, personally, I think, will overshadow this. Uh, and I really hope this contribution, in all of its detail, will help us to think in that way more often. Thank you so much, Hannah. And just to speak from my personal experience with um, uh, being involved in the workshops and interviews, to hear young people saying that they worry for the future before the age of 16 is a horrific, horrific position to be in. And therefore, I mean, that was in December last year. So if we reran it now, I think we would see even more impact on how those young people felt about that opportunity. Um, thank you so much, Hannah and Matthew. I'd now like to invite our distinguished guests to short, share their thoughts and expertise in response to the research. I'm delighted to welcome Guy Standing and Ruth Lister, who are joining us online. Guy Standing is a professorial research associate at SOAS University of London. He's a fellow of the British Academy of Social Sciences and an honorary co-president of the Basic Income Earth Network. Guy is also a council member of the Progressive Economy Forum. Baroness Ruth Lister is a member of the House of Lords. She is an Emeritus Professor of Social Policy at Loughborough University and Deputy Chair of Compass. She has written widely about poverty, social security and citizenship. Guy, if I may pass to you first, please. Well, first of all, th thank you very much and uh, congratulations, Matthew and Hannah, on their report. It recalled that I was uh, presenting my own report on basic income uh, in the RSA in 2019, uh, which was called Battling Eight Giants. And it was based on the research I've been doing over the past 30 years 
And I think it's very important when we talk about basic income to start with a clear definition. I'm against using the term universal basic income. I prefer just basic income because in practice, in pragmatic terms, one would have to have a, a, a strategy for saying that people coming into the country as migrants uh, would not automatically get the basic income straight away. Otherwise, you would get welfare tourism, you'd have problems politically in selling it. You would have to say, we will deal with giving help to migrants outside the system. Now, it's important to emphasize that a basic income is something that it would be paid individually. And it would be paid unconditionally, unconditional in terms of previous contributions in some sense, or in behavioral terms, you have to do X, Y, and Z like you do with universal credit. It's unconditional in those terms. It's also non-withdrawable. It's an economic right that would be guaranteed for people to get each month. And it would be paid in cash or the equivalent, not in vouchers or something which was de determined how people would have to spend the money. So that's a critical part. It's also important to say that the objective of a basic income is to give an anchor of basic security to everybody of equal value. And what that means is there would have to be supplements for all those who have extra costs of living, people with disabilities, people who are uh, having babies and maternity leave and so on. And therefore, the idea would be to give everybody an equal material base. And then you could build other policies, conditional or otherwise, on top of it. Be careful not to present a basic income as a panacea, as a replacement for everything. Then you fall into all sorts of traps that the political right uh, play. I'm currently advising Mark Drakeford and the Welsh government on a basic income pilot being conducted in Wales. It's altering the discussion, it's increasing the legitimacy of the debate in Wales. I was addressing the Welsh TUC recently, and it's encouraged people to say, this is something that we must have. It's also true, as Matthew mentioned, that opinion polls around Europe and elsewhere show that a majority now are in favour of a basic income of some kind. And I think the COVID pandemic uh, increased the legitimacy and support for that. I did a, a, a video with massive attack uh, about basic income and strengthening resilience. And hundreds of thousands of people have viewed it and I've received a deluge of supporting comments from all over the world. So it's it's something that has suddenly moved into the center of, of public debate. Now, I was asked to mention the health issues. I've been involved in numerous pilots around the world, and without a doubt, in every single case where we've had a basic income pilot, where whole communities have been provided with basic income, and experiments where individuals have been given basic income, the biggest result is a reduction in stress, a reduction in mental problems associated with stress and the, the physical problems that derive from stress, cardiac problems and so on. And in the case of Canada, a big reduction in uh, going to hospitals and medical services, saving huge amounts of public money in health services. One of the findings that we found in pilots is quite remarkable, but when you see it, you say it's obvious. And that is that if people have a basic income, they continue to take their medical treatments to conclusion. And that is very important because often people who are impoverished, they start taking medical treatment and when they feel slightly better, they think, well, I'll save money, I won't spend any more on, on medicines. That, of course, is, is very bad practice, but it happens to be what people rationally do if you're poor and insecure. 
And a basic income actually has induced, and we've seen this with strong results, and induced people to continue to take medical treatment. Another result which doesn't get sufficient attention is that we've seen in pilots that as a result of women having individual basic income, they feel more inclined to walk out of abusive domestic relationships. And those relationships are incredibly damaging to the health, not only of the woman, but often of the children as well. And the very fact that this, this effect is strong in basic income pilots deserves to be given respect because it's a feminist issue of enormous proportions. One other point I would really like to mention at this, uh, this juncture, and I can come back with others, is it important for all advocates to emphasize the following point. Every basic income pilot with which I've been involved and every basic income pilot that I've seen the results of, and there now are about 100, have shown the following fact. It results in an increase in work. Just in case you didn't hear that, it results in an increase in work, not a reduction. Now, that is contrary to the prejudice of a lot of critics, particularly from the political right. They claim that if you gave people a basic income, they would become lazy. This is not true. It improves people's sense of confidence, energy, and initiative. And we've seen that. And it also encourages people to do more forms of work that we regard as socially valuable, but which aren't given enough attention in our national statistics and so on, including care work, volunteering, and, and various forms of, of social work. So for me, a basic income has to be an anchor. That's what I've been arguing in my books. It's a matter of justice, common justice, it's a matter of giving people basic security. People who are chronically insecure lose mental bandwidth. Their IQ goes down. And it is also a tool of freedom. That's pretty strong. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Guy. Um, I'll now pass to Ruth, if that's OK. <coughs> and then we'll um, ask for some reflections from Hannah and Matthew. Ruth. <clears throat> Thank you very much to, to Matthew and Hannah and also to Guy for, uh, for setting the scene so very well. <clears throat> and I very much welcome the focus on the impact basic income might have on mental health and well-being. And to my knowledge, that hasn't really been explored in depth before. So it's a, I think it's an important avenue of research. And indeed, psychologists for social change have in the past suggested that the psychosocial benefits of UBI are potentially very wide ranging, in particular enhanced security, which Guy and others have mentioned, and the sense of agency, uh, which I think is very important, as Guy mentioned, about women feeling able to leave um, situations of domestic abuse. And elsewhere, uh, psychologists for social change have argued that feeling secure is central to well-being. And it's, I have to admit, I, I in the past have sat on the fence a bit about UGI, UBI, but it's my increased understanding of the importance of security in the context of growing material insecurity, the significance of which was underlined by the pandemic and which the RSA and, and Guy uh, have done so much to draw attention to, that really has kind of pushed me off the fence um, when it comes to supporting some form of basic income in principle. Uh, and I think the case has been made, made very well by all the speakers so far. So I suppose I was expecting <clears throat> that the report would help increase our understanding of the mechanisms by which UBI could improve mental health um, and well-being. But to be honest, I'm not sure it does really. Um, workshops of young people certainly do offer some pointers, but I think less so the analysis of the Understanding Society data, valuable as it is, because um, I'm not convinced it really shows 
how you be how basic income I'm, I'm i take guys point that about calling it basic income rather than ubi basic income per se can address the crisis and anxiety and depression referred to in the title of the version that i've got because the main message of that analysis seems to be that there's a clear relationship between income level and mental health up, up to a point um, now income levels and in particular, the level of social security benefits, which uh, it is worth noting are under threat yet again, if the government reneges on its earlier promise to uprate in line with inflation next year, which is looking increasingly likely. Um, but th those levels are of the greatest importance. But even though the report helpfully shows how it's, a, how it's possible to achieve a basic income at a decent level, that's not really what sets basic income apart from other uh, approaches to social security reform that improve income levels. So playing devil's advocate, if I was an advocate of a means tested guaranteed minimum income at a minimum income standard, and there seems to be increasing support for this approach is sort of in competition with basic income, I'd use these findings to support that approach. Yet I would argue, and, and this is very much echoed what, what um, Guy was saying in terms of his support for basic income, that a means tested uh, guaranteed minimum income based on a couple's entitlement, not an individual like basic income, would not provide the same basic level of security uh, and sense of agency that psychologists for social change <coughs> argue basic income would do. So my, a question I have would be if there's anything in the data that throws light on this aspect of basic income that I've missed. Um, as Hannah said, increased security was one, of, <clears throat> was one of the positives mentioned by the young people in the workshops in relation to their longer term future. And earlier RSA research showing the high level of financial insecurity and precarity among young people uh, is cited. And though I've not had time, I'm afraid, to read the, the, the companion um, basic income conversation report on winning the vote, which is linked to this report, but, and, and that Matthew mentioned, I did note it placed some emphasis on the importance of security with regard to how um, the arguments for UBI are framed. And, and I think it's a very valuable exercise insofar as I <clears throat> had a quick look at it, uh, looking at what arguments do resonate particularly with people who uh, on you know at first glance are, are not attracted to the idea of a basic income one aspect of the report which hasn't really been mentioned so far which i do very much applaud is the attention paid to the misgivings voiced by voiced by disability groups about basic income it's really important in terms of gaining public support and particularly among those who are most likely to be affected by it uh, among those currently in receipt of benefits that these concerns are addressed by those who are advocating basic income. So I'm sorry if that's a, a bit negative or I've somehow missed the point, and I very, but I very much hope that the report will lead to further research that explores perhaps from an in-depth qualitative perspective, what are the elements of UBR, of basic income itself uh, that potentially can enhance mental health and well-being? Because as I said at the outset, I think it's a really important aspect of the debates around basic income. Leave it at that. Thank you so much, Ruth. And actually, that sets a, a scene for bringing back Matthew and Hannah. Um, I, I wonder whether, Matthew, I can yeah. pick up with you um, Ruth's question about you know, the mechanisms within okay. UBI that actually do support and enhance um, mental health and well-being yeah sure so the, the understanding society data is just a series of waves of data collection on a range of different factors um, and over 10 waves we analyzed changes in income and anxiety and depression scores and we controlled for um, we, we were able to show as, as clearly as we possibly could that a primary driver of anxiety and depression scores was income level. Um, so we controlled for previous year's income and um, we could see that when incomes go down, 
anxiety and depression scores go up. So in the absence of a randomized control trial, this is a good quantitative response. Now at the minute, we're doing something very similar with a, um, a long, well, yeah, longitudinal panel study of uh, the cost of living crisis and anxiety and depression. We expect to be able to present at least quasi-experimental data that suggests that the prim a primary driver is income to uh, anxiety and depression scores. So that, what does is, what is the quantitative work show? It, it builds the case for causality, um, which is sort of common sense in lots of different ways. So then the second point is, well, why don't we just use means-tested redistributive measures to support the worst off? And this is um, an intuitive response. People who need the most support ought to get the most support. But there are a range of different political um, and social challenges that go along with that that, that render that approach um, impossible to sustain, as we've seen through austerity. So the first one is that um, the current means-based system, means and needs-based system, if it were expanded and more generous and uh, gave people more money, would build in exactly the sort of perverse incentives for inactivity that people always complain about in terms of welfare systems. It would create disincentives to, to activity that um, already, and this report highlights this, built into the benefit system. So for example, um, something like my, my mother who's long-term chronically ill, um, any activity that she was able to, to demonstrate um, when she was in receipt of disability benefit meant that she stood a good chance of losing a disability benefit. And the problem with that is that obviously she needs to be active, she needs to be able to, to see people in order to do well. Um, so there was an incentive not to do the very things that would need to be done in order to become healthy. And what you find with means and needs based systems is that they always build these perverse incentives and disincentives into their system. So alongside that, then you've got the political challenge and the evidence that's transformative on the, po on the political and electoral uh, considerations that, that are at play here um, suggest that needs and means based systems are the very worst systems to, in to introduce if you're trying to achieve progressive outcomes. Because people intuitively, they say, all oh, right, yeah, support ought to go to the, the worst off. So then the, the, the follow-up question is, how do we fund this? And for most people who are in work, um, the question is, well, that's just going to come out of my income. Um, and one of the reasons that austerity was so successful was because people regarded themselves as being hardworking, aspirational, ambitious, and saw um, a were presented with a population within Britain who were, in a sense, in zero-sum competition with them. That the welfare system to support these people, they, these people's needs and meet um, these needs, um, would have to come out of the wealth of uh, working people. And what UBI does is turn that on its head. So that's an out-group issue. It's welfare's for other people. What universal basic income does is to transform that and say this is an in-group issue. And all of the evidence that we presented in the report and all of the evidence that we've gathered suggests that as soon as you demonstrate that those in work are given a financial security that previously was associated with those out of work, you get massively high levels of support for UBI. It addresses the perceived unfairness of, of needs, sorry, means and needs-based systems. And quite quickly, people's concerns about sponging, about parasitism, disappear. It becomes less salient. So people go, oh, well, if these people might be getting things while being inactive, but if I'm getting the security with it, there's less unfairness in, in the system, and people support it as an in-group issue. So if, you, if you're concerned with reforming the welfare system, the last thing you want to do is to increase means and needs-based testing. That is a recipe for disaster, as we've seen over the last 12 years. Um, if, you, if people are really concerned about improving security, the only way you can do it is through universal mechanisms, with all the caveats that, that Guy references about um, uh, residency uh, criteria and things. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Um, Hannah, I wondered whether you had any follow-up. Ruth was calling for further qualitative work to really, I suppose, unpick, um, you know, in reality, what does this mean and look like and how could it operate? I wonder whether you had any further thoughts and reflections on that. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Ruth, for your challenge. I think um, 
for me, what's clear is we need something different and better and kinder than what we currently have. And UBI is compelling, but I'm sure there's there's lots of different ways to think about it. In our, I'll mention what we talked about in our workshops, but then I think I'll build a bit on Matthew what you were saying as well. So in our workshops, we did talk about some of the issues you raise about whether or not young people felt that there should be additional benefits on top of a basic income for those that had needs like you described, particularly those living with disabilities. And there was generally consensus that there should be in any formulation, and I'd absolutely agree with that. So um, I think teasing that apart further and thinking about the implications is definitely another avenue to go down. But our initial senses in those groups was um, support for that mechanism. Um, and then I think on your first point and, and thinking about this idea of security a bit further and, and what a UBI offers on top of this idea of the minimum income, at the RSA we have quite a formal definition of, of what we mean by economic security, but um, in simple terms I guess it's that you feel able to cover what you need to with your income now, but also you can look ahead to the future and know that that will either be maintained or improved. And if I think about kind of the formulation we have at the moment of our benefit system, if I was someone who was worried about my current role and, and thought I might be out of work in the coming months and perhaps universal credit was the benefit that would be appropriate for me, I would have very little guarantees about what my income would look like, even if the, the system was more generous. So I would know I'd have to wait five weeks without income before I could receive any money. I'd know that if I was looking for additional work, it wouldn't be very long before I'd have to look for something outside of my current skill set or sector. Uh, I'd know that there's a lot of uncertainty about whether my income would be maintained even if it met my needs now because the up rating seems to be pretty much up for grabs. Uh, and I'd know there'd be a series of activities that might be filled out of my control but would result in that uh, income being reduced or in some cases completely removed as a result of conditionality. So the system itself sets up people to feel insecure and the mechanism for that is to drive people into work. Uh, that's quite clear and explicit, but it does undermine how people can feel about their future, whether they're in work now or not. So uh, I think it builds, Matty, on your point, but there's, there's a complexity to our system that really undermines whether or not people in a month's time or in a year's time know what their financial situation would be, which I think is a critical difference with a UBI, uh, because it is, as, as you say, Guy, it's, it's permanent, it's there, it's, it becomes a right for us, and I think that's a major difference as well. Um, so yeah, just, just a couple of reflections on your points, Ruth. Thank you, and I've just got um, one more question before we, also, before we start opening it up to the, to the floor and those online. Um, picking up on the point around, you know, um, that Ruth made around actually where we're looking at people who live with um, uh, lifelong conditions or um, who have additional needs as a result of um, disability or um, ongoing health. Um, I wonder whether actually I could bring in another contributor um, to this work, Elliot Johnson, just to speak to, the, um, to that aspect of what this needs to look like going forward and what further work needs to be done. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of the key issues that's outstanding in um, assessment of UBI, um, and, and Guy sets it up very well that, you know, I think everyone agrees that we can aim for a basic minimum for everyone, but people have different needs and we need to take account of that. There are things like housing that everyone needs, but there are very different uh, prices for that kind of thing. So this is all part of an, part of an additional consideration of differing and additional needs. There has been a, a concern among uh, disability rights activists and organisations that uh, UBI could lead to an undercutting of the existing system of support. And obviously that builds from an evidence base of the last 25 years of additional increasing uh, conditionality, possibly 40 years. Um, so there is a, a reluctance and a concern that this might lead to worse outcomes for disabled people. And there are a couple of ways to address that. So the first is that we need to look at this from a new perspective. Work is valuable, but not all work is valuable. Some work is hugely damaging to individuals. In disability rights, there's been an agreement that, in general, that work is especially valuable because it's a sign of equality and participation in society. Now, we can look at this a couple of ways. First, as to Guy's point, we know that it doesn't reduce work, uh, worklessness. It doesn't increase worklessness. But in addition, we need to consider all of those currently unpaid factors uh, that people undertake every day, care work, which specifically affects disabled people disproportionately, uh, and voluntary work. 
Now, these are things that disabled people, uh, some disabled people might be able to do. They may not be able to take on full-time work. We need to give value to those activities that we currently give no financial value to. And then in addition, there are plenty of ways that we can avoid uh, this, undercutting of, uh, this undercutting of the current support that disabled people currently get. So we need to approach this uh, from not the last 12 years of austerity. We say that people need additional investment in welfare systems. There are benefits that will return to that after that point. Um, and uh, we can be confident that disabled people will be uh, in receipt of additional needs-based benefits on top of that. Now, I shouldn't say benefits, really, because it's sort of been tainted as a word. Um, but there are plenty of ways to deal with these things. The important thing as well is that consulting with some disability organisations, the vast majority, I would say, do not have a position, a formal position on UBI at present. And that was very clear when I approached them. There are some who are vociferous opponents because they look at it in a sort of the context that has been around, um, but we can design systems that work for them. For the rest, we need to be at the front line of influencing them to say that these are the ways that it could benefit disabled people. And for disabled people more generally, we need good communications on this that says this is not something to fear, this is something that will give you lasting support during the time when things are being assessed. You know, we need support for people while uh, needs are being assessed. So yeah, I, I think there's a whole approach to it and more work needs to be done, um, but UBI should be something that works for everyone and we need to make sure it does. Thank you very much. Um, just before I open to the floor, um, uh, just uh, if Ruth or Guy, you wanted to have any follow-up on what's been said. Uh, Guy? Yeah, 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 person, person. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's attendant on anybody who's advocating basic income to begin by saying the, what has just been said about people with disabilities. You must not give a presentation which doesn't show that up front, that there are necessary uh, reasons for having supplements with, for people who have extra costs of living, including those who have episodic disabilities or chronic disabilities. So I think that's important. But the second point I wanted to make was in partly in response to something that Ruth said, which is that currently there's a popular support for minimum income schemes. I think, I think this is fundamentally intellectually dishonest, because what they're talking about is a means-tested system that you guarantee everybody gets to a minimum, but it's still going to be means-tested in some way. And we know from a hundred years of research from all over the world that means-tested schemes have high exclusion errors. The existing DWP schemes, the legacy schemes, or, or even universal credit, have something like 40% exclusion errors. In other words, 40% of those people who should be receiving those means-tested benefits are not receiving it. The second objection is something that has not been mentioned this morning, but which we, well, a lot of research has shown, is that if you have a means-tested system, you create poverty traps automatically. Now, the current DWP claims, uh, system claims that the marginal tax rate of someone going from universal credit into a low wage job is about 60 percent another if that's the cap i think it's higher but if that were the case then it's it's three times the the, the rate of income tax that an ordinary taxpayer is paying so there's a huge disincentive for taking low wage jobs and in addition that's in my, my books, I've discussed the precarity trap. Because of you have to wait for a long time before you get that means-tested, behavior-tested benefit, uh, you have a long period where you're not getting any income. And then if you take a short-term job, you're likely to be back in a situation where you have a further wait before you start getting your means-tested benefit. And you can easily calculate that over a six-month period, you're going to be out of pocket by taking a low wage job. And, and this is the nature of a flexible, insecure uh, labor market. And there's plenty of evidence that this, is, this doesn't work. 
Now, there are other issues that I'll come back to later, but I think it's important not to be drawn to thinking a minimum income scheme based on means testing is an alternative to a basic income. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open clear and i hope it was clear i was not advocating <coughs> yeah i know i know i know that um, yeah, i know that yeah but um from because i'm not sure if, if um, from what matthew said and um <coughs> the reason i raised it is <coughs> sorry i'm <coughs> struggling my throat um a lot of very influential organizations are now advocating it my understanding is that there have been quite an influence on the scottish government which previously supported basic income but now is looking at guaranteed minimum income schemes and i suppose what, I'm, what i was saying was that any um, advocacy of basic income needs to be clear in, in the way that the guy was about what differentiates what does it offer above a better level of income and, and i'm uh, I mean, and as I said, level of income is clearly incredibly important and your research shows how important it is for mental health. What, what I was trying to say was what I don't think the research shows is the other aspects of basic income that I would have thought are very, particularly from what psychologists for social change have said in the past, but, um, but kind of intuitively, that the security of income the agency involved that you get from getting it as an individual are so important to mental health. And, and therefore that, what I was arguing really was that I hope that perhaps <clears throat> building on this research, it would be possible to, to, to do research, which, which helps us understand those mechanisms that it's not simply, or even though it, it is obviously very much about level of income. And, and what I did say was what I thought, was useful was that it, the the um, analysis of different approaches to basic income show how it is possible to achieve a decent income level um, without you know I mean it, obviously it's expensive it's more expensive than means testing but it is possible to achieve it without kind of breaking the bank so to speak. Thank you for clarifying, Ruth. I just want to make sure we've got time for questions in the room and online. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, first of all, I don't believe there'll ever be uh, any uh, solution to poverty until we have universal financial education in schools from the age of five to the age of 16, one hour a day. Because the problem is that most, a lot of people are completely divorced of the financial world. The second thing is uh, um, uh, basic income will come in when the banks and the governments finally hijack the whole crypto and um, digital system. Uh, the problem there is that, of course, they will then decide what we can spend our money on. Thank you. Perhaps you come back at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I, I think all of the evidence just suggests that people are actually really quite sharp with the finances and the sort of considerations that people with very low incomes have to make in terms of the spending are way and above any that people with decent levels of income uh, undertake. People know precisely the cost of various different goods and what they can spend their money on. So in terms of financial education, that's just, just not true. Um, I think people need financial education in terms of the various different obstacles that they face and the various different complications with the existing tax system. But when you speak to people and work, to pe work with people who have restricted levels of income, you see that on a daily basis, their, their awareness of the cost of various different goods the awareness of the capacity to invest in longer term activities is precise and extremely complicated, extremely detailed and complex and rich. Um, so I think that's, people do need to understand the tax system and various different other things, but, but frankly, people, people on low incomes are some of the most knowledgeable uh, people uh, around in terms of the cost of various different goods. Hannah, I just wonder whether you could give a perspective on that in terms of our wider work that we're doing with the Health Foundation and young people around kind of health and economic security. Yeah, absolutely. And I start with an example from our workshops for this work, which speaks to your point, Matthew. We spoke to a lot of young people and um, one of the young people we spoke to 
was on up to 10 apps at any one time where she was looking for work and she was definitely one of the clearest in the group on, on what her income was at any one time and she knew at what point she'd hit different tax thresholds or different elements um, like that and I think listening to her speak and the precision with which she needed to manage her finances across a really complex terrain I think said two things to me. One, that that financial education underpinning is critical and lots of young people don't have confidence as they transition to that point. Uh, but also that the system wasn't necessarily enabling her to apply that education in a particularly straightforward way as she was working in such a complex uh, kind of employment situation. So uh, I think it's, it's an essential underpinning, but I do think that, yeah, like Matthew says, there's, there's a necessity that drives it. Um, and yet in, in our wider work across young people's economic security, we find similar things that uh, education is something that young people discuss and that they want to grow their confidence in and they do notice a gap in formal education to support them, particularly thinking about what it means to start to rent or to live independently. There is a gap in, in the system for that, um, but it's not necessarily that they're entering something hugely straightforward when they get to that point, uh, which definitely helps to undermine that confidence as well. Thank you. Um, I'll take um, two questions here. The gentleman in the front and then the, the lady back on. Thanks. Uh, Paul Atherton, I'm a fellow here. Uh, I've also been a member of Basic Income Earth Network for about, well, over two decades now. Um, the great late American comedian George Carlin always used to say that we need poor people to scare the middle classes to keep going to work so that the rich people continue to be rich. So my question really is how or have you done any research into the power structures and how people at the top of the pyramid who don't want any of this to happen beneath in terms of sort of converting them and having them sort of embracing the ideas and the communications because obviously what we saw in Switzerland back in 2016 was the public went up they said we want universal basic income they voted and they voted universally against it um, now I know it's happening in Zurich again this year but it's specifically Zurich and well, I'm getting a shake from, from, from <laughs> guys it's not happening in Zurich this year all right um, but yeah, so I'm, that's what I'm, I, I'm interested in, is, is the communications, whilst people from the bottom are all going, this is a great idea, are we getting the same from the top? Matthew. Um, yeah, so I, I think that um, economic elites have a diversity of positions on this, and there are lots of uh, different owners of business who regard this as essential to the perpetuation of their, their, their businesses. I think Elon Musk's got a position on this. Um, so it's one of the interesting things about UBI is that it, his, it has a history um, from across the political spectrum. And I, I think the, the difference seems to be about the degree of generosity in payment that, that determines whether somebody's uh, support comes from a right or, or left-wing position. So I, th I think there's actually increasing support among these sorts of actors because I don't think they can see any way of sustaining their businesses without... Um, yeah, low paid workers having some degree of security. Great, thank you. I can take um, just, sorry, one more question in the room and then um, a couple of questions online and then if we can follow up um, also if we're not able to take all the questions in the room afterwards. Hi, my name is Noreen Tarani, I'm a psychologist. So I've been kind of interested on the psychological side and actually mental health. Uh, I do a lot of uh, psychological surveillance, and mental health is multifactorial. It isn't just one thing. And what I was wondering about your research was which direction are we going in? Because I know that if people have mental health problems, they're much more likely to be poor. So, you know, is this a correlation? And should we really be looking at mental health more widely than, than purely poverty? Or if we are going to look at the poverty and mental health, how do we actually connect them up much better? So, I, yeah, I, I think I can um, respond to that. So it, this gets back to, to Ruth's point. So the, the central argument of the report is that it's not just quantity of money, it's the quality. And it's the security of income that enables people to um, preserve their interests and to escape demeaning circumstances. The Understanding Society data recognises that the relationship between financial security and anxiety and depression is bi-directional, so that if you develop a mental health condition, um, it can have an impact on your, your income. 
But the vast majority, uh, the, the, the evidence that we produced suggests that the primary driver in that relationship is from income to anxiety and depression as, as specific conditions. And I think what we see in Britain today, but also in, in lots of un, other unequal societies, is that if you develop conditions like anxiety and depression and you're on a good wage and your family are also um, from backgrounds in which there are good wages, you can only fall so far. And actually the long-term impacts of developing these conditions are not as grave for those, those people um, as, uh, as, as within other socioeconomic groups. So actually people are protected by their income. And when you look at the clustering of, of anxiety and depression in our samples and the health gradient, it, I, I think the evidence is quite persuasive that low paid people who are exposed to financial insecurity day, on, day by day um, are much more likely to develop anxiety and depression specifically. It's a different case with uh, severe mental health conditions. Um, but uh, yeah, no, anxiety and depression, I'm, I'm quite confident. And, and we've got a longitudinal panel that. Uh, that hopefully will bear this out over the winter. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to um, take a couple of the questions that have come in online. Um, this is a question from Al Cheshire. Uh, what do you think the impact of UB services may be if UBI is introduced, given the downward trend of funding to these services currently? And I wonder whether I can pose that to Guy um, and Ruth online. Do you want us to answer now? Uh, y yes, Guy, please do come in. I, I, I think this is a, a, one of those false dichotomies that I regret is taking place. If you look carefully at those advocating universal basic services, uh, they're not universal and they're not basic in many respects. I don't know your needs for particular services, but they're different from mine and everybody has different services that they want. I, I believe that you should have a proper, proper, proper market system for, for many of those services. I believe in the NHS should be a free at point of uh, need and public schooling should be free and so on. But uh, I don't think that they should be put in counter uh, terms, people need basic material security. And that basic income is the context of being able to give people a sense of security going forward to make choices and to look after their basic needs as they see fit. And I'm not a paternalist and I don't think one should expect services to make make the difference. I worked in the Soviet Union and I've been in China a lot where they've had so-called universal basic services and they tend to be lousy. Um, so I'm, I don't like the dichotomy of this debate, but of course we need good public services and much better than we've had under this government, which is an atrocious decline of our public services. We need that, but that's a separate need. They're not one or the other. We need both. I very much agree with that. Um, I, I'm I'm a bit unclear as to what universal basic services would mean. But I mean, if we take, for example, education, which is, you know, there's a basic right to education. And I was at a um, conference yesterday of N Child um, of the Child Poverty Summit uh, in London, uh, and I was chairing a session on social exclusion in education. And it's very clear, I mean, the work of Child Poverty Action Group and others, that if you don't have adequate income, you can't benefit from your education. And we're seeing that, I mean, those of you in London, the standard this week and last week, I mean, endless articles about young, you know, children coming to school hungry, unable to learn, um, uh, hide, trying to hide the fact that they don't have enough money for, for to pay for school meals because they don't qualify because they're not their, their income is supposedly too the parents income too high and so so I mean the, the two are so integrated to be able to <clears throat> enjoy those services you need a decent income um, and uh, the, the question in terms of austerity I mean I think both 
as as I said, and I think um, Hannah said as well earlier that social security benefits, working age benefits are under real threat at present in just the same way that services are under real threat. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, the, chance, the new chancellor has made very, I don't know if he'll remain chancellor, but very, very clear that, um, and is being advised by one of George Osborne's advisors that, you know, the danger is we're going into a new age of austerity which could hit both benefits and services. So the last thing we need is them sort of competing with each other. What we need is that we need people to have access to decent income and decent services, and, and that should not be prevented by poverty. Thank you. And um, a final question um, uh, for Matthew. This is from Dave Beck from Salford University and the UBI Lab. As a supporter of UBI, I'm struggling to square the circle of environmental issues. Would a UBI result in more environmental issues, do you think? No, I don't think so. I think it's actually critical for dealing with the various different climate change catastrophes that are upon us. Um, I think there's a consumptive effect. So Natalie Bennett uh, recently highlighted the impact of poverty on the amount of resources that people use. So you can imagine if, you, if you're dealing with very small amounts of resources that come in either periodically or insecurely, your first instinct is to uh, satisfy the short term. So you buy cheap stuff. And cheap stuff is not only more environmentally disastrous in its production, but it's also more likely to just break straight away. So you have to replace it. So it might be instead of buying an expensive pair of shoes, like the, these were about 60 quid or something, I used to buy rubbish shoes. Right, and I'd go through them really quickly. And the amount of cows that have been killed for rubbish shoes um, is uh, incalculable. Um, so you, if, you, if you give people more resources, they spend more, um, they, they allocate more resources to longer term sustainable uh, consumption. So that's the first thing. Um, it also enables us to reduce the amount of totally wanton pointless activity that is environmentally destructive. The amount of needless travel um, for uh, pointless activities. Um, the, uh, yeah, the rate, there's a wide range of just, just, just pointless activity in society that could be reduced. People travel less in certain respects. People travel differently. Um, that only happens if people have got more financial security and more resources. Thank you. Um, so this has been a really fascinating session. I know we haven't managed to get to all the questions, so I would just ask if, if it's possible to pose them to um, our, our kind of speakers and contributors today. We will try and follow up. Um, thank you all for joining in person and online and for your thoughtful comments and questions. Um, the report is now up um, on the RSA's website and you can find um, links in the chat as well as for more information on the Design for Life mission. Um, all that's left for me to say at this point, because we've actually, I think, also opened more questions for the next um, chapter in, of this work, is to thank our fantastic contributors, uh, Guy Standing, uh, Ruth Lister, Matthew Johnson and Hannah Webster. And thank you all very much for joining us this morning. <laughs>